North America, uh, whatever I've discussed, it will be primarily for US, but also referencing in some cases, uh, the market in Canada. I have about 17 to talk about. I have a preamble. I'll talk about the product, the potential and opportunity, the process of getting started, the purchasers, getting buyer, getting prepared, and lastly, participation. How do you get started? Uh, knowing fully well that even though it's export for Ni from Nigeria to North America, um, you are representing yourself as either, and I'll show a different option of where we can come in as Nigerian diaspora and how, of course, whatever it is we are doing also in part at home, the businesses that you have to work with, I mean, since whatever it is you are going to be distributing in North America are going to be produced back at home in Nigeria. Now, I saw this on the platform. Uh, maybe some of us might have also seen it before. I'll just go through it uh, as we start. And it was talking about why Naira is actually 850. Sorry for the error there. Why $1 is 850. Uh, and it says we are, we are far more productive in 1980 than we have today. In 1980, the key reason for economic growth were as follows. Number one, we are a net exporter of refined petroleum. And the reason why I'm going through this is just to show, look, this is what we used to be or used to do, meaning we've done it before, meaning it can also be done again. But sincerely, we need your cooperation working with you out there to be able to make this a reality. We rode on in locally assembled cars, buses, truck, Pojo cars in Kaduna, Volkswagen in Lagos. Leila Nibana, Anamko in Inugu produce, we produce our buses and truck. Stia in Bauchi produce agricultural uh, tractor. It was not just assembling, we were producing many of the components. Vono product was produced in Lagos, SI in Ibadan, producing battery, not just for Nigeria, for the entire West African market. Isoglass and TSG in Ibadan, producing windshield, Ferrodo in Ibadan, producing brake, pad, and disc. Tire being produced by Dunlop in Lagos. Um, Michelin in Podacot. And I mean tire produced not from imported rubber, but from rubber plantation in then River State. We're listening to radio and TV set assembly in, in Nibadu by Sanyo. I'm sure some of us are very much familiar with some of these names I'm mentioning. We're using refrigerator, freezers, air conditioner produced by Tamoku. We're putting on clothes from UNTL Textile Mill in Kaduna. Chalaram in Lagos, not from imported cutting, but from cutting grown in Nigeria. A toilet are fitted with WC, produced at Kano and Abeokuta, and we're cooking with LPG. LPG stored inside gas cylinder, produced at NJC factory in Ibadan. Electricity also were flowing from cables, produced by Nigerian wire and cable. Ibadan, carbon metal in Lagos, and Paracot. We had Bata and Leonard, another very common name at that time, Bata and Leonard, which were also producing shoes, not from imported leather, leather from leather produced in Nigeria. Even with, even Nigeria, how we at that time also were going to different de destination. And that explain what we've done before. And just to put in perspective the fact that, look, it can be done again. Now, currently, we have that extinct rate differentials. I mean, wide gap, $1 to about eight fifty in the parallel market. How does, I mean, we're very more familiar with the fact that the more dollar we have, of course, the more, the more inflow we have in terms of foreign reserve, the more the value of Naira. And this inflow coming, the diaspora community contribute the remittances and others. We have foreign portfolio investment. We have the foreign direct investment. We have trading goods and trading services. Now, what's interesting about it is that we 
as a Nigerian, we only have control over trading goods and trading services. We don't have control over foreign direct investment. We don't have control over foreign portfolio investment. Even remittances, we don't have control over it. You decide you are going to send money back home. The investor decides they're going to invest in Nigeria. And I'm going to show you a data that shows how these are declined significantly in recent time. And that explains why we have what we have in terms of the exchange rate differentials. Now, look at the trajectory of export from Nigeria, declined to 2020 because of COVID, now at 67.3. Now, 67.3 is, is abysmally low compared to what we should be doing. And I'll show you data from other countries that are not even up to Lagos state in population. I'm not Nigeria, not even up to Lagos, but doing so much in terms of export, 62.7. But what's interesting about this 62.7 is that you will notice, which is where our challenge is, the non-oil, which is our focus in this conversation, is just less than 15%. In fast as at Q1 re data released by MBS this year, Q1 just about 10.06%. Just about 10.06%. Now, I want you to look at this. This is the foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment. Do you see both the foreign direct investment? Foreign portfolio investment and even other investments, can you see how everything has gone down? Mainly because of the kind of the um, policy Nigeria was operating at the time, as far as FS is concerned. Because there was no transparency and there was so much disparity between the parallel market and, of course, the official exchange rate. And with coupled with the fact that a lot of people were stealing the crude oil and we're not able to get a lot of export proceeds. Now, with this level of decline in foreign direct investment, of course, we shouldn't be surprised because the demand for FS is still there. It's still growing. We are still importing as much as we were doing before. People are still traveling abroad uh, for vacation. People are still going for holiday. People are still going to school. And all of them need foreign exchange. So there's so much demand, and that contributes significantly to what we have seen in terms of the exchange differential. Now, I'm doing all this background to talk about the fact that we can contribute to the growth of trade as far as effort is concerned. Sincerely, we can do so much to support a lot of business at home by also acting as representative. And of course, this is a business for you. So you also make money in the process. But while you're making money, you're also contributing to the effects inflow into Nigeria. Because you are right there in diaspora and you actually are within the market that we need to be able to grow our FX inflow. So let me talk about some of the product. And I'll be showing you some of the data of exports that Nigeria already or currently do. Look at it. Can you see crude oil? petrol and gas contributing 85%. So any change in the price of this significantly impact on exchange rate. If we are not able to get as much as we should, it affect the exchange rate. Can you see what is on the right-hand side? That is the remaining 15%. But let's see, let me expand it a little. Before I do the expansion, Look at the total export for the 2.4 billion. This was only COVID. But if you look at the data I showed earlier, it was 67.3. That's as at last year. But I want you to check some other countries in the world. <coughs> countries like Netherlands, with a population less than Lagos, doing 692 billion. And by the way, this Netherlands export, in fact, all these from even the Belgium, 548, five, four, all of them are doing more. When you combine the whole of African export together, Belgium, France, Italy, South Korea, Hong Kong, they're all doing a lot more than the whole of Africa put together. And one of the reasons is because we have done a lot in terms of export of commodities, 
and we have done done a lot in terms of value addition, which is one of the things I'll be talking about in the course of this conversation. So if you look at this now, you can see the item we're exporting. These are items I can currently export. I also show you data of what US imports, some of them, both US and Canada, some of the item they import, uh, which of course you see there day to day as you go to different stores to buy different things from cocoa to oily seed, low tobacco, cocoa butter, spices, Nigeria fertilizer, gold, wood, charcoal, um, raw aluminum. Now, if you drill down a little, you can see the cocoa, cocoa beans, um, raw tobacco, soya beans, cocoa butter, cocoa paste, soup and broth, starch residue, residue beer, other products include oily seed, coconut and Brazil nut. These are what Nigeria currently export. Perfume plant, spices, dry fruit, raw aluminum, scrap copper, raw copper, raw lead, refined copper, scrap aluminum, gold, precious metal, scrap metals, precious stone, nitrogen fertilizer, pesticide, soap, cleaning product, um, crustaceans, concentrated milk, raw bone, fermented milk, fish fillet, live fish, other pure uh, oil, granite oil, palm oil. Now, when you look at the volume of those products in terms of the global market demand, this and this, our own contribution, you will see a great disparity. The fact that, and that's an opportunity for us really, because we can do much more better um, petroleum, Nigerian market share of petroleum in the world is just about 5%, 4.68 as of 2020. Out of the 640 billion, we're doing just about 30 billion. Cocoa beans, market size, 854 billion. Nigerian contribution, 5.73. You will notice that look, as much as we talk about some of these things as, oh, it's our foreign thing, Anna. But what are we doing? Can you see Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Cameroon doing a lot, lot better than us in this area? Cocoa butter, $5.8 billion market. Our contribution, less than 1%, 51.1%. Then cashew nut, $6.87 billion. Our contribution, 3.13. That's about $215 million. Spices. 3.61 billion. Our contribution, 1.7. Now, it's good to put this in perspective. The fact that more than 70% of Nigerian farmers are peasant. We have close to 40-50% post-harvest losses. And we have not utilized up to half of the arable land. In spite of all these shortcomings, we are still doing this much. Meaning, if we become more mechanized, meaning if we begin to use more of our land, meaning if we can control the post-harvest losses, we will do a lot more. Because in spite of this shortcoming, we are still doing this much as a nation. Constitutive milk, a market of $1.4 billion. Contribution from Nigeria, $7.92 million. That's about 0.037%. Palm oil, $3.34 billion market. We're, not even do, we're barely doing about $1 million. <coughs> and I heard Malaysia came to pick up their seedling from Nigeria many years ago. Gold, talking about minerals, $4.22 billion, 0.052% in terms of contribution from Nigeria. Lead ore, $6.23 billion. $25.9 million from Nigeria and zinc oil, $7.93 billion and 0.4%. Now, this just to show the fact that we're not doing so well. We're not doing well at all, actually. But we can do, but it's also a great room for improvement because, and like as I said, for us to be able to grow beyond the fact that, okay, financing is required back home. But one other critical area is collaboration between home and abroad. 
collaboration between home and abroad. It is something we must be very deliberate about. And I'll tell you why as you go along, because we need to develop the market to be able to encourage investment back at home. If people know there are demand for this product and there are representatives out there who will ensure that this product get buyers and payment is made, then it becomes easier to also get more investment coming into the sector at home. Look at some other products that are currently produced in the country from, um, from, from food, agro process, uh, cosmetics, fashion, and the like. These are all produced from Nigeria. This Modera, these are cream produced from Nigeria. This is PAP. Currently, this PAP, I export it to the UK. I know some people currently take it to US and Canada, but I currently export this directly to the UK. And here you have shea butter cream. Now, what's interesting about this is that you see the PAP, this PAP in, in blue pack and white pack was produced. The company that produced this is the same company that produced this. Now, that's instructive. I'm aware of Nigerians who are in North America who have their own brand. They have their own brand. They produce the pack, ship it to Nigeria, and get companies in Nigeria to produce for them in their own brand. Meaning I can actually own my own brand right there in the US. So that means I'm bringing it in. I am not have to worry about, oh, what if the people are buying, are calling the people I'm getting from. You can actually brand for yourself, meaning you can protect your market. And there's so many companies that you will be able to do this with. Here you have Winflower and the pub. Like I said, this lady, Adarex, is not the producer, it's not the manufacturer. The manufacturer here is Tasty Pot. So that kind of arrangement is something you can take a look at. This is a different kind of cream. This is herbal tea, different type of herbal tea. Then you have here nuts, different kind of nuts. And then of course, uh, this pepper is preserved for at least one year and it does not have preservative and it's produced in Nigeria. Here is palm oil. This is the three set of pap I currently export to the UK. These three pap, the yellow, the brown and white are all uh, what I export currently to the UK and also actually looking for market and distributor <laughs> in North America. Now, here are clothing for, for children and for adults. Here is a pepper soup. This pepper soup is produced in Nigeria. You basically open it, put it in the hot water, and it's good to go because it's freeze dry and all produced in Nigeria. Here's another product. These are cosmetics. And these are produced in Nigeria, Kanda, soap, cream, uh, lip balm. Now, just to show you some products already produced locally. So the reality is because of the demand of some supermarket locally and the desire of different businesses to sell abroad, a number of businesses, the serious ones, have had to step up their game in terms of ensuring that they have their product packaged in a way that will be acceptable to buyers or potential buyers in the international market. Now, let's now look at US and Canada, potential of some regular products. And these are just a few products. There are so many other products I didn't include here. I'm just looking at the one that we currently produce, uh, that also a number of which have potential in the US market. If you look at the US market, a very huge market, of course, 2.7 trillion import. Now, US is the largest importer in the world, largest importer in the world. And we call US control about one third of the world uh, purchasing power. So it's not surprising that we have this demand in the US of different products by the US. Nigerian import, by the way, is less than 60 billion. The whole of Nigeria import is less than 60 billion. South Africa is about is much more than Nigeria in terms of import, but US is 2.7 trillion. That's a huge market that you can take advantage of by collaborating 
with Nigerian back at home. And one of the services we render at home is, in as much as you might have concern about working with, uh, I mean, getting people to work with, what we do is to protect you. So if you are working with someone or someone is sourcing the product, we can work with that person to ensure what you're buying is of the right quality, loaded into the container and also helping you to do the shipment to you. Now, because so that at the end of the day, you are not here, but you have your eye here to be able to ensure professionals are working with you to also ensure that the goods are well packaged and shipped to you for you to be able to distribute in the American market. So a huge market, let's explore some part of this market in the US. Oil products alone is 11 billion that US is importing. From rapeseed to palm oil, to pure olive oil, to coconut oil, to steric acid, to pure uh, vegetable oil, to margarine, to soya beans oil, to glycerol, to seed oil, to feed oil, to bovine and sheep and good fat, $11 billion import of US alone. Import of US alone for oil product. Let's check up on that product. From coffee to tropical fruit, vegetable, vegetable, other vegetables, other fruits, tomato, banana, cut flour, grapes, cucumber, rice, vegetable sap, citrus, onion, coconut, brazil nut, cashew nut, frozen fruits, and not frozen vegetable, perfume plant, lettuce, spices, wheat, uh, gluten, Sowing seed, melon, dry legume, tea, $51.9 billion. I mean, this is just a category of product, almost more than half of the whole of import of Nigeria or export of Nigeria. I mean, this is a demand in the US. So the demand is very, very huge. I mean, for different products in the US, the demand is very huge. Let's look at other products. This hard liquor to wine to baked goods to beer to fruit juice, processed crustacean, uh, chocolate, flavor water, animal food, processed fish, sauce and Sydney, raw tobacco, raw sugar, pasta, animal food. All these are import into the US market and 86.6 billion dollars. $86.6 billion. Look at another one. These are clothing materials. Neat sweater, non-neat non women's suit, neat t-shirt, neat women's suit, uh, non-neat men's suit, house linen, um, leather wear, leather footwear, textile footwear, rubber, rubber footwear, fake air, different kind of material. $169 billion. $169 billion. Let's move to Canada. Total import of Canada, $467 billion. $467 billion. Let's drill down on some of the items that Canada import. From wine, to baked goods, to animal food, to chocolate, to flavor water, to hard liquor, to uh, sauce and seasoning, malt extra, soya beans meal, raw sugar, processed crustacean, prepared cereal, processed fish, $22.5 billion. $22.5 billion. Coffee, other fruit, corn, grape, citrus, garbage, I mean, cabbage, lettuce, rice, sowing seed, banana, tomato, apple and pear, melon, soya beans, $13.7 billion. $13.7 billion. Pure olive oil, margarine, fish oil, palm oil, coconut oil, steric acid, seed oil, bovine and goat fat, glycerol, soya beans oil, $1.8 billion. Clothing materials, $19.3 billion. Now, having looked at what Nigeria is able to export vis-a-vis -vis 
what um, what North America, US, and Canada are also able to import. Let's go through the process. So how do you take advantage of it? What is the process involved? If you want to be exporting from Nigeria to Canada. Now, there are different options you can explore. You can decide that you want to just be a buyer who import and distribute. Or you want to be a representative who is not going to incur cost of importing and distributing, but representing businesses and helping them to find buyer and of course earn commission on every transaction with the client you get for them. You cannot go decide and say, look, I want to set up a branch in Nigeria. That means I have to get a limited liability company registered in Nigeria with export as one of the objective of that company. And then of course, I'm able to get my export license certificate and do the shipment from Nigeria and ship to myself. That means I am shipping to myself and distributing it. There are different options available you can explore. Depending on the time you have on your hand, the advantage you have in terms of structure you have, both in Nigeria and in the US, and whichever one uh, that catch your fancy. But the idea is this, there are options you can explore. In fact, for the lawyers, you can say, look, I want to help Nigerian businesses to recover, to help them get buyer and recover debt. I mean, they've shipped, payment is not made. I want to help them recover their debt in Nigeria so that they can, their debtor can pay them. So there are different ways you can actually support and in the process, of course, earn income. Let me go through the process. First of all, is preparation. I will spend some time talking about preparation later on when I talk about export readiness. But preparation, preparation is at the point where we are asking important and critical question, how ready is the business? Export readiness, how ready is the business? What are the things that need to be done to become export ready? Those are the things we'll be talking about on that and I'll talk about preparation later on. Then promotion. Now, when I've set up all I need to set up to get ready and be prepared, then promotion. Promotion here basically is I've decided on that preparation, I've decided on the product I want to be bringing into US and I'll show you some of the products that are prohibited from being imported into US. Um, so promotion, I need to begin to promote. And I will also talk about some of the options available for you to promote right there in the US. Purchase order. Now, after the business is prepared and then promotion happen, the next phase is purchase order. At the point of purchase order, what I'm doing is getting the contract signed. Remember, you can be an agent, you can be a distributor, you can also ship to yourself and have a branch of your business in US or in Nigeria shipping to yourself. There are different options available that you can explore, but the point is that there'll be a purchase order or sales contract that the buyer and seller will have to sign. Then you have the procurement or production. Now, here's my thing. Number one, of course, I will recommend we focus more on value-added manufactured goods so that you reduce the issues around quality issues and the like. So value-added manufactured goods. Now, if you're doing value-added manufactured goods, it's also wise to start by procuring or doing contract manufacturing. By procuring or doing contract manufacturing in which someone is producing for you. In which someone is producing for you, in which you can be trading it directly or they are producing for you in your brand. And of course you're trading that. So production and procurement. And of course, after that, you have the packaging and labeling. Then pre-export documentation. What happened in pre-export documentation? To be able to export from Nigeria, you need to be a limited liability company that also has export as one of the objective of the company. A limited liability company that also has export as one of the objective of the company. Because that enables you 
to be able to get your export certificate, which is a prerequisite for pre-export do documentation. So you have the NXP, you have the pro forma invoice, the NEP Senegal Promotion Council and license, the CAC Certificate of Incorporation, then next Nigerian Export Supervision Scheme, then Certificate of Origin. Now all these constitute pre-export documentation. In addition to this, there will be processing of the single good declaration and of course, clean certificate of inspection. Now, don't worry about these documents. This is what we do for our clients. So <laughs> we will handle that for you. If you are getting goods out of Nigeria, we will handle this for you, uh, for your business. What you need to do is to ensure the business is registered. Uh, if you want to do that, this, all this process will be involved if you are if you are setting up a branch in Nigeria. If you don't have a branch in Nigeria, if you are just a distributor in the US or a representative who help companies to secure buyers and end commission on those transactions, you definitely don't need all this documentation in Nigeria. But if you want to set up in Nigeria to ship to yourself, of course, these are services we can render to you. Pre-export documentation, then port clearance, then post-export documentation. Post-export documentation are documents that you need in the US to clear the goods. Now, if you're bringing in goods, you, it's good you talk to either in Canada or US to custom brokers. Custom brokers are the ones that will clear the goods through customs and they already know the documentation requirement beyond the usual bill of lading or airway bill, invoice. There are no more other documents that might be required depending on the nature of the item in question. A custom broker can easily get those information for you and is the one that will clear the good for you anyway. So it's good you have such organization or company to talk to in the US it can give you a lot, they can give you a lot of information that will help you in clearing the goods right there uh, in the US. Then presentation of document. Presentation of document. Presentation of document to the bank of the buyer abroad or even to the buyer abroad. The, the buyer receives the document and then is able to obtain his post-import document in the US and of course, effect payment to wherever it is that it's shipping from. Now, to expect from Nigeria, there are items that are prohibited. And some of them include maize, timber, rawhide and skin, scrap metals, unprocessed rubber latte and rubber lamb, artifacts and antiquities, wildlife, animal classifiers, endangered species, and all imported goods. Now, list of US contraband, goods that have been prohibited and restricted from import into US. Dry snail, dry snail, are not authorized to be imported into US because they threaten to become a successful invasive species and become a severe agricultural pest. Exotic snail can be highly invasive, causing havoc on agriculture and human. Vegetables, such factor as importer are important because of fresh fruit and vegetable can introduce pests, dairy products or milk, animal skin, chicken products, seeds, rice, designer products, and root products. Now let's talk about purchasers. Now, this is where the work is for us because where we come in in the chain is the sourcing of purchasers. Either you want to be the purchaser or you want to represent Nigerian businesses who are in need of purchaser. As a matter of fact, a number of um, businesses that want to go into this space Many of them believe that their major challenge is finding buyers. Their major challenge is finding buyers. And that's where we come in, to be able to assist in finding buyers. Now look at this. If you look at this chart, there are different channels to source for buyers. Social media is an option from Instagram to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to YouTube. These are 
social media platform through which you can source for buyers. B2B trade portals. These are business to business trade portals that if you register on this platform, you will be able to get businesses who are looking for a particular product in a particular country. And you can decide to focus your energy on US or Canada in this case. For the Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, it will involve promoting. It will involve promoting the product you are trying to sell and directing the promotion to you, to your phone or to your website where you'll be able to engage those that are seeing that advert that showing interest. Another very interesting option is database companies. You know, you want to know who are those that are distributing a particular item in the US, you can get it from database company. In fact, you can get it from companies that are importing, I mean, the data of company that are importing a particular item into the country. That means I can easily have access to businesses who currently import those products or who currently distribute those products. Then, of course, attend international trade fairs. And then partners abroad, overseas sales representative, overseas subsidiary company, and overseas sales brand. And I'll spend a lot of time on this. This is where we can really be of help. And of course, any number of income, a lot of income rather, in doing this. And that involves overseas sales representative, overseas subsidiary company, and overseas sales branch. Now, let me differentiate them. Overseas sales representative. In this case, you are representing businesses. You can be representing three, four, five, six, seven, ten businesses. As their agent abroad, I will talk about your responsibility later on and um, what you can do. And of course, at a fee, typically a commission on the transaction. Overseas subsidiary. Over subsidiary means you actually have a branch in Nigeria. You, sorry, you actually is your partner with a business in Nigeria. So the business in Nigeria is not your business, but you are partnering with that business who is also registering. I mean, you're funding a joint venture with that business in the US or in Canada. Now, branch is a station where you set up a branch. So you have a branch in uh, Canada or in the US, and of course you have the exporting company in Nigeria. Now I'll spend time explaining the uh, overseas sales agent. Look at what happened here. In where you are overseas sales agent, you are representing an exporter in Nigeria. And you can be the consignee of their shipment. What does that mean? Meaning that when the shipment is done, documents are sent to you, you have control over who is able to clear their goods. And that make it easier to also be able to ensure you are able to get payment because now you'll be delivering that document to the company who has signed the agreement to take up the goods. They will be the one to clear, but you are going to give that document to them. Payment method. Now, one of the challenge of international trade, particularly for new businesses, SMEs, is the payment method. Sometimes they don't get a favorable payment method. What's payment method? It has to do with the way document is exchanged for money. It has to do with the way document is exchanged for money. What does that mean? Document exchange for money can be in a letter of credit form or bill for collection or advance payment or open account. Now, the different payment method. Now, if I have a representative abroad, it doesn't matter the payment method because ordinarily, if I do a cash against document or open account option, what that means is that I will do the shipment quite all right. 
But when I do that shipment, I run the risk of not getting paid because in that kind of arrangement, the buyer did not give me, the buyer did not give me a guarantee that payment will be made. Now, but this payment method that appear risky constitute 85% of the $21.5 trillion trade in the world. Trade volume in the world is $21.5 trillion. Out of this, 85% is done on open account. In which case, the good is shipped by the exporter, document is sent by the exporter to the importer, importer clear the goods and pay afterwards. That exposed the exporter to the risk of not getting paid. With a sale representative abroad, it can mitigate that risk of not getting paid. And that's one of the things you can do, service charge. Of course, the service is not for free. You can do this for three, four, five, six, seven businesses, and you can charge them for your service. You can charge them for your service over CC representative. Having a service charge, document handling. The fact that you are representative means you will receive document on behalf of the exporter and deliver the document to the buyer in the US. Like I said, that gives you control and be able to ensure you have the right undertaking uh, collected from the buyer before document is delivered so that he's also obliged to pay as at when payment is due, payment default risk. Overseas representative help to mitigate payment default risk because of the present. In fact, even if the buyer is unscrupulous and has a fraudulent intent, by general knowledge of knowing that this company have a representative at destination, he won't just, he won't do, he will be careful in trying to try to defraud the, 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 the exporter because he has the representative abroad an environment where you can easily enforce uh, the contract, it becomes easier to get such payment out. Marketing at destination. One of the major function of you as a representative of the exporter from Nigeria is marketing because that's actually what you are also any commission for. You know, I, I, I work with a company in the US who we charge an annual fee and also charge commission. You will charge, and so for you to register, you pay a fee, an onboarding fee. And then for every shipment, they charge commission because they help in securing the buyer. More importantly, they don't just help in securing buyer, they also help in ensuring that payment is made. They even went further to the extent of not just helping that payment is made, also helping that securing funding to be able to pay the Nigerian exporter on time while the US entity can pay afterwards. So these are different services that can be rendered to support business back at home while you're also earning income in addition to whatever it is you currently do there. So marketing. So one of the job is to market, market. Because the, the, like I said earlier, that one of the major challenge the number of businesses face is that they complain about the fact that they don't have, in fact, we have had to develop a pack for this. And the pack also will be of uh, help to you because to be able to implement some of those things I've talked about in terms of getting those buyers even right there in the US. We have to come up with that pack. Why? Because so that they have a, a material, it has a manual and some video that do a demonstration for them on exactly how to find buyer. Why was that necessary? Because many always complain about the challenge of being unable to get buyers abroad. Growth potential, the fact that a representative is abroad means it can, it, it can market and get two, three, four, five buyers. Now, getting two, three, four, five buyers for an exporter increase its growth potential. Why? Because now it can do much more than it used to do. Control of the market. 
the fact that you have everything that brought also give them control of knowing exactly what's happening in the market. I've mentioned debt recovery, which is one of the very important value that a representative abroad is bringing to the table. And of course, sometimes, particularly for commodities, particularly for commodities, you have a situation in which there is a second level, second leg of inspection at destination. Whenever there's a need for the second leg of inspection at destination to happen, a rep abroad can help to coordinate this. Now, let me compare if you decide to do a representative or you set up a subsidiary or you have a branch. In terms of payment method, you can use any payment method. Of course, in terms of cost, the cost of having a subsidiary and a branch is more. Document can be sent to this representative and subsidiary or branch. Payment default risk is reduced. This representative become your marketer, help in growth potential. Of course, the cost of setting up a subsidiary or branch is high because of fixed asset, because of payment, of course, of, of salary and wages. It's easier to recover debt and of course, manage inspection at destination. Now, as a representative, you can also help in setting up a warehouse where the goods come into, the warehouse where the goods come into. You can have an overseas sales branch, overseas subsidiary, I've talked about that, and of course, you can be a distributor. A distributor means you are buying and selling. That means you are carrying inventory. And if you are doing that, it's good you do that in your own brand name. That means the company in Nigeria can do white labeling for you. White labeling in the sense that they are able to produce for you blank and then package for you in your brand. So you can be a distributor, but of course you can also be an agent. Now, the manufacturer can go through you as an import merchant, that's the distributor, or as an import agent to reach the end users or the buyer at destination. Depending on the options available and what is convenient for you, you can decide to be like I said, a representative, a branch, or set up a subsidiary. Now, how then do you prepare? How do you prepare? The, one of the major challenge of businesses coming into this space is the challenge of readiness. Challenge of readiness. Trading normally, even locally, is challenging. When you now add the higher complexity, of shipping abroad, then it becomes more difficult. The need to then become export ready become very important. Export readiness is a multifaceted concept that involves the ability of a company to successfully enter the market, sustainably compete in the market, and significantly grow its share until it becomes established in the export market. So number one, successfully enter the market. Number two, sustainably compete in the market. And number three, significantly grow in the market. What you see is businesses entering successfully. Some are able to sustainably compete, only few grow and become established in that market. Now, what are the factors that hinders businesses for being able to grow or to compete or to even successfully enter a particular market? I call them the sign of lack of export readiness. The sign of lack of export readiness. Number one, delays, incessant delays. 
incessant delay can lead to demorage. By the way, demorage is the fee pay for the usage of container. Beyond the free period, why the container is in the custody of the shipping line. Demorage is the fee paid for the usage of container beyond the free period why the container is in the custody of the shipping line. What that means is that with demorage, the exporter will be incurring more cost. With demorage, the exporter will be incurring more cost. But this more cost can be avoided. This more cost can be avoided. It can be avoided. It can be avoided. Why? It can be avoided because if you are working with a, a, a client agent that knows exactly what he's doing, it can be avoided because you can do all your documentation early and prevent that issue from happening. And that issue is discrepancies. Discrepancies. Someone said, how do we mitigate frequent rejection of good exported at the point of entry? Very important question. Now, one of the way to mitigate this is to focus on value added and then to do pre-shipment inspection. Focus on value add. Value add means it's already processed. But it's processed doesn't mean that it can still have one or two defects or the other. It's to do pre-shipment inspection. If there's a pre-shipment inspection, the exporter will be able to know, oh, something is wrong with this product. If there's no pre-shipment inspection, he himself might not even know that there's something wrong with the product that I am trying to export. And that falls under defective goods. The question just asked now, fall under defective goods. Defective goods is a major challenge. Now, when there is a delay, demorage, discrepancy issue, losses, frequent losses, not something that happens occasionally, frequent losses, or even dropout of business, the, of the business, are all evidence of lack of exporting. Now, and I'm not saying if this happened just like the case of COVID. I mean, that just happened uh, on plan for, but if you have this issue happening, so for example, someone mentioned issue of quality re and rejection. If almost every shipment you have issue with quality, it's a sign that the business is not ready. As in the, the people running the business have a challenge with understanding important things they need to do to be able to prevent this. And this is very important because like I said, being able, being able to prevent this from happening is what will sustain the business. Someone said it's been observed that a lot of Nigerian exporters now go to Ghana to export their product. <laughs> and even label it as made in Ghana. Is it? Now, one of the reasons why people were doing this was because of the exchange rate issues. And then the issues at the port. One of the reasons is exchange rate issues. Exchange rate issue has been sorted out. That's not a major issue now. People can sell their dollar at a, a more reasonable rate. Now, the issue at the port, there are ways around it. I do shipment from time to time, and sometimes I have to use badge. I have to use badge. That means instead of I won't take it to the port, I'll take it to maybe Ikorodu or to my two and put it on the small vessel that will move it into the port. Now, some product is because it's banned from Nigeria. So for example, beans is banned for export from Nigeria, beans. Yam is not allowed into Canada from Nigeria. So they would take the yam to Ghana and ship it to Ghana, from Ghana. But Ghana have been able to sort out their issues with Canadian agency and they can ship the goods into Canada. Because beans is prohibited from Nigeria, people are now shipping the beans by road to Ghana and shipping it out from Ghana as product of Ghana. Because if it comes from Nigeria, because of the fact that 
we put a lot of pesticide. So, but some people have been able to solve that problem to ensure they use organic pesticide. But they have a challenge that since the ban has not been lifted, even though they have organic pesticide and they can ship quality product, but because of that labeling of the country as a result of quality issue, it affects them. It affects them. So that's why they have to go through Ghana. Thank you very much for your question. Okay, so like I was saying, now those issues, all these issues being raised are issues that are causing, are as a result of lack of readiness, readiness. Let me give you an example. During COVID, I exported, a number of business in Nigeria I exported in spite of the challenge of COVID. Now, if the business is export ready, it will still be able to do it, even in spite of challenges. Even in spite of challenges. Someone say, how do we get started <laughs> on the journey as an exporter? I propose different options. Option one, option one, you can be a representative, meaning you just represent Nigerian businesses and sourcing for buyer and any commission. You can be a representative. Number two, you can be a distributor, meaning you will carry inventory. You buy from Nigeria. So the Nigerian entity sells to you, you buy from them, pay them off and distribute in the US. Number three, you don't even want someone to sell to you. You want to set up a branch in Nigeria, source the product using your own structure and network in Nigeria, set up the business, get your export license and ship to yourself. So option one, you are not even involved in carrying inventory. You don't want to be involved in, you just want to source for buyer, help follow up on payment and your commission and you're fine. Option two, you want to carry inventory. You want people to ship to you and you pay them off and you distribute. In that case, you're not worried about the Nigerian part. You're only thinking of distribution in the US and register an entity to distribute in the US. The third leg is to have a branch in Nigeria and have a branch in the US that will be doing the trading together. These are the options I would recommend for you to be able to. So it's when you decide on each of these options, then you can know, okay, where do we go uh, from there? You say, is it advantageous to be exporter of any of all the products, jack of all trade, or focus on the particular item? Now, I don't think you should focus on an item. I think you should focus, you can focus on a sector, a range of product in a sector. Maybe you want to focus on cosmetics, so cream, different cosmetics, or focus on food, processed agro product, different ones, or focus on commodities, different commodity in their raw form, or focus on mineral, mineral in their raw form. So it, it, it's not good to, I don't think it's wise to focus on just one product. I think it's good to have different product in a particular area that you have developed expertise. So that even if one or two products are not moving, there are still demand for the others. So I don't think it's wise to focus on just uh, one product. Now, this is particularly important for a business that want to, for a business that want to uh, export from Nigeria and even distribute in the US. How do we identify a company that we can partner with or be as representative? Now, what we do as a business is actually to assist you with that. So if you want to be a representative and you are, and you are looking for businesses you want to represent, we have um, clients from time to time who will be interested, who will be interested, who will be interested in working with you to represent them. And they will incur the cost of sending samples to you to be able to help them look for buyer on that side. So for these three options I talk about, we can assist with our services in Nigeria. That's actually what we do uh, with uh, in the UK and also currently in the US. And US is a very big market, so the more we have in the US, the better. Promoter. Now, the promoter needs to be ready. If the business is going to be ready, the promoter needs to be ready. Now, so in this chart, you will see four factors. The company factor. 
the capacity factor, the country factor, and the companion factor. The company factor involves the promoters, the products, the pricing, the predisposition of the staff, and the purpose for going into export. The capacity, promotion, proficiency, production, and payment, and position. On the country factor, the people, the paperwork, the potential, and the companion factor, partnership and purchaser. Now, this is where you're coming. A business that will be able to sustainably export need a partner abroad. A business that will be able to sustainably export needs a partner abroad. Successfully enter the market, sustainably compete, and also significantly grow. It needs a partner abroad. And I've checked many businesses within and outside the country who have been in export for many years. And I realized this has been a model that many of them have adopted that have kept them in business for many years. Let me expand on this. The promoter are the owner of the business and they need to be export ready. And they can acquire the experience and understanding through capacity building. Then the product, that's the item of export, which must have good quality specification, which must have which must have good packaging and labeling, and of course, unique characteristics. The pricing is determined by the cost of the goods, being able to source raw material locally, being able to uh, achieve economy of scale to a very large extent can help to control the issue of pricing. Start predisposition. If you're going to work with people, if they don't have foreign orientation, of course, they need to be trained to be able to attain that status. Purpose. You know, I tell people that if it's to make money, there's so many things you can do to make money. If the business is going into export, there must be other interest. And I'm talking now for businesses who is exporting from Nigeria. Now, for you on the other side, you are already, you are representing. Now, if you are going to be doing the model in which you are both the exporter and the importer, then it's important that you have a very strong purpose. You know, for example, some people currently ship to Nigeria from the US. They keep up to convert the Naira of their sales in the US to dollar at an expensive rate to be able to buy what they need to buy and ship from the US now. But that same business can be importing into Nigeria what is buying in the US and exporting to the US to generate forex. So yeah, in the US, you currently ship to Nigeria, you can begin to generate forex. Instead of converting the Naira at an expensive rate to dollar, bring goods to the US, sell them in the US, generate forex. So that foreign exchange can be a strong reason to want to go into export. That's for businesses who is exported from Nigeria. But for you representing, of course, you already earned commission and you're fine. Payment, that's getting paid and funding. Getting paid, particularly when you don't have a secure payment method. This is where having a partner abroad become important. Having a partner abroad become important. And of course, it also involves being able to raise funding and be able to source, uh, to, to pay local supply of the goods. Then production, to production capacity, meeting demand, meeting market demand, meeting market demand. It's a factor critical so that you don't get to the point where demand is growing and it's not able to meet the demand. Proficiency, skills. So there's a number of capacity building. We have some material we'll talk about later on. And we have training program that we can use, uh, that you can subscribe to, to be able to learn more about this. Promotion, increasing awareness. I've talked about this. You're already in the US, so you can easily promote. And you can leverage on all those options I've mentioned later, um, earlier. Positioning, a product you want to sell should be a product that already have goodwill locally. People are already buying it locally. In fact, some of the products, you know, there are some products. You came into Nigeria, you saw it in shop, right? You bought it, 
You took it abroad. You use it. You love it. And you are calling the producer that you need more. That's the product position for the export market. Potential market opportunity. You know, I showed you some data when we started. And those statistics is to show you the opportunities available in your environment right there in the US. And there are data available online to be able to know for every product you're looking at, what is the demand like? What are the opportunities? It's good you know the opportunity, else you might be investing your energy in product that doesn't really have huge demand. Paperwork, documentation is important. I've talked about the fact that you need a custom broker on that side that will be able to educate you on the kind of documentation you require for the nature, the nature of a product. And of course, the people, that's talking about the demography and the kind of targeted consumer destination. Then the partners, the partners, the partners. This is where I think we can come in. You know, having three, four, five, six, seven, ten Nigerians that are doing what some people are already doing in the US. If we have a lot of people like that, we can grow significantly export from Nigeria to the US. Of course, you make a lot of money in the process, but more importantly also is that you are going to be supporting a lot of job creation and poverty eradication back at home by creating market. So you're making money, but you're also creating value for the economy and of course, for the country. And of course, the purchaser uh, getting the agent and distributor. As a round off, I will talk about participation. Participation, participation. Now, in going into export, you can be a passive exporter or an active exporter. As a passive exporter, you can invest in export. Or a professional supporting one area or the other. As a lawyer, as a broker, as a representative. Or you can be an active exporter who is exporting services or exporting product. And in exporting product, you're exporting commodity or manufactured goods. I talk about the part that can help you. You want to now have a good understanding of, okay, how do I start marketing Nigerian product in the US? Or how do I represent Nigerian business? What are the things I should be looking at as I represent Nigerian businesses in the US? We've created a pack. The pack, it has, it has a soft copy. It has two manuals inside, plus 27 videos that show some demonstration, taking you to some website, even in the US, in North America, showing you exactly how to go about finding buyers. So you can also equip yourself with some skill of what you need to do. And like I said, this material is available on soft copy. So you, you do, if you want hard copy, we can also dispatch to you. Uh, from Nigeria. It's called Eureka Park. It helps to secure buyer abroad. It's safe cost of searching for buyer, safe time for searching for buyer, safe energy of searching for buyer, help in, to service multiple buyer, and of course, secure credible buyer. Now, there are, three, there are imp some important things that this park actually do that I would like to mention before I close. Very important things that the park actually do. Number one, it helps to the, the, the business to be able to know where exactly are these buyers. You know, it's like, I'm trying to get buyer. Where are these buyers? First of all, it gets you prepared to be able to find buyers. Number two, it gets, it helps you to get the online tool that you need to deploy. There are two you need to deploy online to be able to find buyer. It helps you to get the list of market with demand for the product you're targeting. It helps help you to know which product are having demand. And I've shown you some of them today. It helps you to get lists of importers in that market. It helps you to get contact, not just the list, even the contact of those importers in that market. It helps you to get the export to convert the contact to contract in that 
export market. We also have what we call from export novice to export legate. If you are trying to set up a branch in Nigeria and you need to train your staff or people you want to work with uh, in setting up the branch in Nigeria, we have what is called from export novice to export legate. It's a capacity building and mentoring program designed to help you get started on this journey. We also have an airport coaching program. It basically covers it's an advisory service, export logistics advisory, export market advisory, export product advisory, export pricing advisory, export payment advisory, export contract advisory, export paperwork advisory, and of course, finance advisory. And then of course, we, we and do logistics. So if you have good you want to ship and it involves shipping by air or shipping by container, we also have a support service that can help us, that we can use to assist you get that done. You can get a number more information about us on our YouTube channel, Voice of African Trade. Kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel, like, share, and drop your comment for us. Ability to participate and overcome the challenge of export lead to great possibility beyond your imagination. This is because it is capable of creating a great platform for repeat business from the same buyer, referrals to other buyers can help to replicate the business model in other country. It also helps to redeem the country image from abroad. It helps you to recruit multiple partners and distributors abroad. Also rebuilding broker bridges within the and raking more income even more than your projection. And I'd like to say if we'd like to overcome, I'd like to say rather that in this post-COVID era, if you want to diversify our economy, if you want to grow the GDP and create employment, if you want to boost foreign reserve, if you want to increase the value of Naira versus other currency of the world, aggressive drive for non export is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bamidele. That was thank wonderful. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, we have the open open floor for people. Do you have questions? Is there any area we want him to explain further? Um, this is we have um we have about 20 minutes to answer questions. So yes. So if you have a question, can you just um raise your hand then we just call you to come in? You have any question or you have any idea or you have any personal experience that you want to share? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Dr. Teresa. Yeah, please unmute yourself and answer your question. I mean, and ask your question. Yeah, like I text, uh, uh, put on the chat there. It's a lot of information here. Um, would you have other sessions? So we could, as we get this and process with time, maybe um, when you have another session, we're here again, it would make more sense. And uh, we will have considered um, area. It's vast, it's, it's, it's great information and, um, would you be having another session again? Okay. Um, yes, we will. In due course, we will. Yeah, we'll let you know. But the, um, the recorded section here will also be, um, I'll talk to the secretary. We're going to have that on the NIDOA uh, chapter so that you can listen to it again. Um, there's a okay. question that we have. Did I, did I answer your question, Dr. Teresa? Um, yes. All right. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. There's a question here. It says um, that um, Nigerian exporters now ship through Ghana. Okay. Oh. I, I I answered that in the course of the conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. What's yes, going I on? I saw a couple that? of questions and I try to answer it as I go along in the conversation. Okay. So can you can you explain further, please? I must Okay, so I talked about on. the fact that. Um, a number of factors were responsible for that. One of them was foreign exchange because uh, they are forced to exchange, to sell at a cheaper rate uh, before 
the Naira was floated and that discouraged a lot of people. So they have to go and export through other, other country. And also the fact that um, some products that are prohibited from Nigeria are allowed to be shipped out of Ghana. A good example is beans. And so people who have solved that problem of pesticide now have to go through Ghana to ship because the ban has not been lifted of Ni on Nigeria from EU. So they have to ship to the EU through Ghana. And also some also have issue with the port because of the delay at the port and they have to go to nearby country to ship out. Uh, and I talk about the fact that for the shipping out, there are ways around this. The fact that instead of wasting time queuing up on the road to the port, what I do is to use badge, put the container on the badge, and of course ship it into the port to them. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, I I spoke with someone last week, and uh, the person told me there's a policy that the U.S. He gave to African countries about exporting, I mean, importing things from, uh, from Africa and their phones that are available. And Nigeria hasn't been able to, I mean, sort itself how to do this, but Ghana is already taking advantage of that policy. Are you aware of the policy? Is it a fund or a unilateral it's trade arrangement like AGOA? I don't know if it's Agua um, you mean. I think it's Agua, yes. Yeah, Agua. No, Nigeria is taking advantage, but we're not doing very well. We're not doing very well. Can you tell we're us about well. this, this? Yes. Um, so it's called African Growth Opportunity Act. It's a law of the United States that enables sub-Saharan Africa to ship to the US a set of products duty-free. And the idea is to encourage it to support growth of sub-Saharan African countries by ensuring that their product is more competitive so that if a Chinese or a European or another country in South Africa is shipping similar product, that of Africa will be cheaper because the duty payable on them are less. But like I said, some of the challenges we have is why I say we need Nidua to work with is being able to have a number of businesses on this side to support in getting buyers. That's one of the things we've not really, it's just coming up and a few people are really doing a lot in that space. I believe if we sort that out, getting funding into this space will not be a challenge if we have a lot of people solving out some of, sorting out some of this problem. Someone said Nigeria is definitely not taking advantage. Of course, we are not taking advantage. We're not even scratching the surface of opportunity available under our goal. And which is why this kind of conversation is good. And because um, I'm hoping a few people will be interested in the class today and be able to support with uh, su support services in the US. All right, thank you. I got a question here. It says, um, Nigeria is definitely not taking advantage of the Agoa and it ends in a year or two unless it's extended again by act of Congress. Uh, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa are taking, are taking most advantage, advantage of it. Yeah, that, that was what I just responded to. It, mm -hmm. is, is to expire, I think, 2025. Obama extended 2025 before he left office. Uh, so let's hope that if it's not extended, then we won't be able to. But sincerely, we've not taken advantage of it. Okay. All right. I have another question here. So the presentation was very rich and informative. I presume that participation requires investment. Could you explain how much is involved to register as to register as an importer of products to the US and Canada? Uh, I don't how much investment, uh, how much do we need if we, someone wants to go into this kind of business? How much capital is required? No, I'm uh, sure with 10,000, 15, 20,000 dollars, it should be possible to start. Okay. It should be possible to start. Okay. Another question say, what can we do differently to take better advantage of Agora? I think you have. You want yes. To what we can do that? differently is to solve the problem of educating our people, number one, and then working with people like you abroad who will help to secure those markets. 
if we have a lot of people helping to work on securing market abroad, we will be able to grow, grow uh, in Agua. Mr. Joe is raising up a hand and he's doing some work in that space. I'm sure he can add some value to this conversation. Okay. All right. All right. Let, let's just take this question before we go to, so that we're not missing anyone. We said, what can we, someone said, what can we do differently to take advantage? Oh, I think we did that. That was so one of the answers. How can on we leverage our in our drive? Exit is always available to fund businesses that want to is to be able to meet their criteria, they are multilateral organization, uh, but they are always available and they are helping a number of Nigerian businesses, only that they, are, they don't have a lot of product for SMEs. Most of the time is for the large corporate that they support. Are there any Nigerian government program intervention or waiver to assist uh -huh. protective exporter to get started? Uh, I know that if you export from Nigeria, getting license is very easy. You can, you can get it online. You don't need anybody. It's 13.5. Exporting from Nigeria, you don't pay export duty. You don't pay VAT on your export proceed. And these are some of the incentives. And then there's also what is called the export expansion grant. Even though that does not come regularly, but it's one of the incentives that government give to exporters to be able to encourage them in the business. But it doesn't come in regularly, but at least Government do give it, and people do get it from government. Okay, thank you, Mr. Olubeyi Migaojo. You have the floor, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, um, and thank you, Mr. Ibibor. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this um, um, webinar. Um, my, I'm I'm just giving recommendations because, like Mr. Ibibor rightly said, we we've been in this. Um, sector and then uh, we're, we're a strategic partner as well and we as we are located in the united states as well as nigeria so um, my recommendation to anyone that wants to go into export is they should first of all go and learn the ropes so that uh, uh, because it's it's very lucrative it creates a lot of opportunities However, it requires you to learn the end-to-end -end of the process so that um, you are not um, putting your money at risk. That's the first one. Uh, because everything that has an advantage has a lot of risk as well. So if you are going into an export um, project or export investment, um, our recommendation is that you learn. Um, maybe you ask people that have been doing it in the past that are uh, technocrats in the field and that they will be able to explain and put you through. And another um, addition to my recommendation is that um, you might want to visit the West Africa Trade and Investment Hub. So it's under the USAID and they have a lot of educative programs and guidelines for you to be able to export into America. So the fact that you live in America doesn't mean that you have the leeway to just bring products into the country. Um, you want to learn what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, what processes are allowed, how do you do certifications of your products um, so that you don't have issues. And once you get the training done or the knowledge, the sky is your springboard in the export sector you have to worry less about things. You just keep making your money and then it's a seamless process. But the first thing is um, my recommendation, try to learn. Don't just say like, oh, they say there's money in export, then go and take a loan from Bank of America and just put it on it. Boom. And then, you know, uh, so because there's the custom and border patrol aspects here when your product gets to the United States that your products must be in compliance. And um, uh, there is the compliance uh, process in Nigeria, which may not be much of a problem, but when the products are coming to America, especially, uh, you need to comply with a lot of stuff. A few people get to smuggle their stuff into the country. They cannot do large transactions. 
a lot of people still do it today. There are some products like Maltina or Amstel Malta and some other products that are not allowed to be brought into the country legitimately. Some people still, you find it in African stores in America, in Maryland, in DC, everywhere. But you want to learn what you can do and you have peace of mind that after you put investment on it, you know you don't need to worry about the risk that much. Uh, definitely, there's going to be the risk of the product being the containers being on the IC and all whatnot. But, you know, still, that would give you peace of mind. That I've complied 100% with U.S. regulations uh, because I tell people, once you comply with U.S. regulations, you don't need to worry about any other thing. The second stage now is the American markets. Um, if you want to delve into American markets, uh, there are processes and data you need to work with to be able to navigate each side. You don't want to bring in five containers of, say, shea butter, and you don't know who is going to buy from you. You need to know who the off-takers, who the already buyers are, and who the buyers that are going to trust your product are. Um, I'm saying this from experience because, you know, we've, we've been around, we've checked the market and everything, and um, I would want a lot of people to learn from our experiences. Uh, we started as a research company, then before we uh, uh, translated into a real trading, um, international trading, import and export trading company and consultancy. So uh, just my few, uh, my two cents to everyone. It's a fantastic opportunity, it's a fantastic field, but you want to also learn the details, know what the risks are, and then so know where to go to. And um, if you need um, any literature, any support, any advice, uh, Mr. Amy Boy is uh, available. Our company, Lickenberg LLC, too, will be happy to support in any way. Um, that you need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ojo. Mr. Ojo, do you work with Mr. Oyemibo? Ayemibo. Uh, well, we are we are partners actually. We are strategic partners. We've been working for years together. So uh, we, I think. Are you based right in the US? Now. Say again. Are you based in the US? Yeah, I live in America. Oh, okay. So, are you a member yeah, of Nigeria? I'm an international trade lawyer, actually. That's my are expertise. You, are you a member of Nigeria? I have been a member of Nido in Washington D.C. for I think also four or five years. Um, I think there was supposed to be like an official um, trans, maybe transfer of data at some point, and if that's a point where, you know, I think I. I've not completed the process. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I used to attend NIDO meetings as far back as 2018, 2019, and at uh, the uh, embassy at Washington, D.C. And I've spoken there a couple of times uh, as well. Okay. I'm Thank sure you. we would like to speak with you after no this problems. meeting. No uh, yeah, problems. Um, would you be able okay. to please send your um, number directly to me? Myself, the, sec the, the vice. The vice president is online here with us, and now uh, we also have the president of Nigeria. Who is the vice president? Um, Dr. Babs. Dr. Babs, okay. Yeah, and we have the president, we have the secretary, we have the director of uh, community development and the director of membership. Okay, yeah, I, I, I knew uh, Miss Patience Keys as a president at the time when I joined. That mm -hmm. was uh, a while ago. So I'll, I'm happy to share my contact, not a problem. Please. My office is in Washington, oh. D.C. I'm positive you have, have a lot to, you have a lot to contribute to us. <laughs> yeah, my office is in Washington, D.C. And then we have a, a new warehouse for distribution across America in New York, in Buffalo, New York. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Please don't forget to send your number. We'll, we'll be contacting you very soon. No okay. Problem. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Honorable Dokunfak Duyele, I'm sorry, it took some time to get to you. Your hand is raised. You, you want to say something, sir? Yes. Uh, first, just want to appreciate uh, all the contribution, Dr. Yemi, but, uh, but thank you for 
the information is very uh, informative and uh, uh, very, you know, encouraging. And also the response uh, from the last gentleman. One thing I want to ask, I think you did mention something, how you can be a passive, uh, how you can invest in it, even if you don't want to be an active. And I think we cannot ask you, you know, we cannot follow through with all these questions today. That is why we're saying that uh, as the director and also what uh, our Naidua director of membership, uh, Ms. Shola uh, Kwata said is we're going to try to bring you back where we can actually ask more questions or you can, you can provide us some good response. So my question is on your website, is there a way you can send information out if somebody do not want to be active exporter, but you want to be a passive one, just like you have said, you have those different paths. How could somebody be involved today? And mm -hmm. I think that is important because like, you know, people that want to do this, they might want to try to be passive to start with. And then maybe as they move forward, it might be where the training that uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Ojo said is where they will be able to go through and learn more about it before they become active. So as a passive investor or passive participant of the exporter, where and how do we get more information? Thank you. All right. Um, um, I mean, like you said, uh, a session for conversation around this would be necessary. But for the passive, um, apart from being an investor, you can also render support services Something similar to what Mr. Ojo already do, uh, is already doing rather. In addition to that, um, being a representative at destination. Now, in investing, it now depends because um, it's good that Mr. Ojo is here and he understands the terrain in America a lot better. And I think having a synergy within the group. Uh, with this kind of arrangement will make a lot of sense because then since he has structure on ground, it then becomes easier. Whatever investment you're bringing in, you are sure of um, what the fund, where the money is going to. For example, um, for product coming in, if someone is shipping from Nigeria and you need someone to distribute, you are funding the goods being procured from Nigeria and there's a markup for you for the distribution of that goods in, in the US. That kind of arrangement is what I will be looking at uh, because since you are on the other side, for those that are on this side, most of the time what they do is that's in Nigeria is to team up with exporter to raise funds, work with them to do the shipment and the money come and then they, they, they share the proceed. But since you're on that side, that kind of arrangement is what I think will be possible. And I think another session with detailed information will probably make that more clearer. Thank you, Mr. Angie. Um, right. You want to say something, DK? No, no, that's uh, fine. Yes. I would just say that was good and it's necessary for us to have a follow up. I think, you know, a lot of interest in understanding this more. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, NJ? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. And um, thanks so much for the information so far. So my question is for Mr. Ayemibo. Um, I've been listening to everything that we've been saying this evening, but I've not heard so much on insurance. When, when you talk about one, the business insurance and then the goods as well, the insurance on the goods, right? So um, I don't know how effective insurance is from Nigeria on the goods. Um, are there, is there... Um, insurance on goods in transit, or let's say your goods get contaminated um, before they get to this place, how well can one recover in terms of insur insurance in Nigeria? How good are the insurance companies in Nigeria? All right, thank you. Um, because we did not go into a number of details that I would have loved to talk about, so that's why I didn't uh, mention that. Definitely, I mean, when I do shipment, I always do insurance both good in transit and marine insurance. And that for me is important because even if the mishap does not happen, you just want to ensure the investment is protected as much as possible. So um, 
insurance is very important. I know also that um, Mr. Ojo do liability insurance for some of the transactions he handled in the U.S. It's an area I think is important because that's very important to protect um, the investment of the goods. So it's a necessary part and of course it's part of it. But I could not talk about it in detail because of the fact that we didn't have enough time and it wasn't the focus. It just to demonstrate the opportunity. That was my focus. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll now yield for our vice president, Dr. Thomas. Oh. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bermideli. Uh, it has been so much uh, informative uh, section that you provided and we're very grateful. And I think a whole lot of people are showing very much interest in making sure that maybe this is an area that they need to uh, be involved in. And, and I think that uh, by promoting investment, uh, both here and in Nigeria, it's a good thing for everybody. And so, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my head with such a wonderful and informative presentation that you made today. And I also like to thank Mr. Ojo for his contribution as well. And our able, um, uh, uh, Mrs. Akpata for uh, moderating the, um, this very forum. Uh, I think everyone has learned so much tonight and we know that this is not going, this is just the beginning of uh, our interest in this area. And I would like to welcome you back at some time after we've digested all these processes so that in case we do have any further information, you'll be able to assist us in any way possible. And of course, I'd like to also, as uh, uh, Mr. Pata just said, like to at least uh, be uh, a consultant for us so that we go along and we have some of our members have, uh, asking questions. We can have a professional to kind of guide them because business is a serious thing and no one wants to lose. And so the experience you share with us today is so invaluable that at least begin to um, stimulate our interest. And at the end of the day, it also means the mission of the NIDO Atlanta that we must uh, foster the well development of all our citizens, either in business, in other aspects of life. And this is one of those occasions tonight. Thank you so much for the job that you've done tonight. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Um, the recorded version will be sent to the group so you can we can all listen to it again. And uh, hopefully we'll bring uh, Mr. Bamidele back again very soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank good you night. very much. Good night.